Good morning, everyone. I am Dan Seitz, senior pastor here at Hillside. If you have a Bible with you, now would be a good time to pull it out and open to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11. You can also find the text in your message notes. And while you're turning to Luke 11, I'll share with you that recently I have been reading a fun book by a guy named Toby Wilkinson about the golden age of Egyptology. And I will say this about this book. If, just like our compassion, justice, and mission director, Randy Fishback, if your secret fantasy is to dig up millennia-old antiquities by torchlight while cracking your whip on the backs of Nazi thugs. You are going to love this book. I can already see Alan Pennebaker uh, opening up his Amazon app right over there. <laughs> and like you, uh, I'm sure, you know, I had heard of Ting- King Tut's tomb, uh, but apparently, this is interesting, before that blockbuster discovery in 1922, the biggest archaeological find in Egypt after the Rosetta Stone was the Sarah Payam Monument found in 1851 by the French archaeologist August Mariette. It was this enormous subterranean tomb. And I learned something really interesting, that for centuries, Egyptologists had known about this fabled find from ancient sources. The problem was that the descriptions were not detailed enough for anybody to locate it. That is, until... August Mariette picked up his whip and his fedora, and he went on the hunt. Now, to tell you the whole story of this historic find would take us down a dark tunnel from which a sermon from Luke might never emerge, okay? But to suffice it to say, it involved pouring over papyrus, bartering with Bedouin, map making, midnight digs in sandstorms, and dodging corrupt customs officials. I mean, real raiders of the lost ark kind of stuff. Now, here's where I'm going with this. When, late in the night on November 12, 1851, Auguste Mariette, candle in hand, passed through the limestone door into the Serapeum Monument, a door that no one had darkened in 20 centuries and beheld the grand hall in front of him. He and everyone else entered a whole new world of Egyptology. And at that point, with this discovery, all sorts of scattered pieces of Egyptian history fell into place in the field of Egyptology again exploded. Now, why do I tell you this story? Here's why. As apprentices of Jesus, most of us are aware of wanting to enter a whole new world of prayer. We know that prayer is absolutely central to our Christian lives. It's central to our own Jerusalem journeys. We know that prayer is the trail mix of that journey. Well, just like that limestone door was the passageway into a whole new world of Egyptology, so the passage we are looking at this morning is the passageway into a whole new world of prayer. Now, preachers love big talk, and I love big talk more than most preachers, but that last statement It's not an exaggeration. Listen to what I'm saying here. If we, like Auguste Mariette, if we pass through the door of Luke chapter 11, 1 through 13, and verses 5 through 13 in particular, which is right in front of us, we do not need to brave sandstorms or poison darts to reach it. If we do that, we too can enter a whole new world of prayer. So here's the plan for the morning. First, we're going to do a flyby of the first four verses. And these verses give us the four basic petitions 
the four basic prayers of Jesus followers, and then we're going to do something that will be my favorite part of the sermon. We're going to dig into verses 5 through 13 to discover what Jesus is saying about the style of that prayer or the spirit in which we engage in it. Sound good? All right, let's dive in, starting at Luke 11, 1 through 4. It goes this way. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. This is the Lord's word for us. For purposes of context, during his own journey to Jerusalem to fulfill his life's mission, and this is right after his visit with Martha and Mary, Jesus is praying by himself. And this is typical for Jesus. Luke, in particular, emphasizes how often Jesus retreated, got away from the crowds, and engaged in loyal, loving listening to his Father. And, of course, that gets our attention today as modern-day disciples, because Jesus is our model for life. And Luke tells us that one of the disciples asks Jesus to teach them all how to pray. And apparently this disciple points out that that John the Baptist had given his disciples a, a distinct prayer to pray, and this disciple wants the same thing for their gang. And apparently Jesus is actually pleased to be asked this question because he immediately launches into a lesson and he gives his apprentices and he gives us today a model prayer, a template that we can use, filling it in with our own words. And our prayer as disciples who are people on our own Jerusalem journeys has four priorities. First, we disciples are to pray that God's name would be hallowed. And the Greek word here means to set apart or to treat as sacred. Now, this prayer, this first one, it might sound like kind of a tiny thing or a, a technical point just to check off a list, but actually it's, it's huge. This one petition. This first one contains a world of possible requests, and we see why when we consider the Old Testament background. Now, I'm going to explain this kind of quickly, but stay with me, because this is interesting, and this is important for understanding the big story of the Bible, uh, which is important for understanding all the smaller parts, okay? In Ezekiel 36, passage that was written hundreds of years before Jesus came on the scene, when Israel is in exile in Babylon, the Lord speaks, and the Lord says that he's concerned about his name. The Lord laments how his name has been profaned, how his name has been dragged through the mud, disgraced in the world due to something very specific, how his own people have lived how his own light of the world people have lived. And instead of living, you could say, as bike reflectors of God's ways and God's character, they've lived like black holes. They've lived unloving, unfaithful, unjust lives with the result being that the world has been unimpressed with God, even looking down on him. That's what the passage says. And this is a tragedy for a lot of reasons, not least of all, Because human well-being and flourishing is all wrapped up in being rightly related to the God who made them. But the problem is, if the world holds God in contempt, they'll never come to him, both to give him the love that he deserves as the one who made us all, and to receive all of the benefits that we get when we become his friend. And of course, The same thing is true today. You know, when we fall short of being God-like, which as my friend Dan Carl recently reminded me, means being merciful, gentle, peace-loving, 
upright in the way we use our power, wherever we might have power, generous, meaning when the freezer's down to just one scoop of fish food, we give it to our spouse and we choke down the vanilla bean, okay? That's generosity. But again, the point that the Lord was making then and what's true equally now is that when we fall short, actually the world gives short shrift to God. So what does the Lord decide to do? He decides to solve this problem. And in Ezekiel 36, 24 and following, he says he's going to do something amazing. Soon he's going to regather his people and then he's going to re-spirit them. He's going to give them a new operating system so that they can finally reflect him in the world so that God's name and reputation can be rehabilitated and so that the world will come to him and be healed. Well, what's the upshot? Here's what. Knowing now, as we do, how God intended and still intends to hallow his name, meaning to make it great in everyone's minds, and knowing as we do now that God succeeded in that plan through Jesus, specifically through Jesus' death and resurrection and the pouring out of the Spirit and the creation of the church, knowing those things, we know now that to pray for God's name to be hallowed is to pray that we and all of our Christian brothers and sisters all throughout the globe, from Denmark to the Dominican Republic, would be who we are, his light bearers, because that's how God desires that his name would be celebrated through our world-loving service to the whole world. And now do you see how big this first prayer point is? It encompasses every prayer that we pray for our church. Every time we pray for each other to be the Jesus men and women, enemy-loving people, justice-seeking people. We hate unfairness wherever we find it. Truth-guarding people. Every skin color people, the people that Jesus died to make us. To pray for God's name to be hallowed is to pray for the church to be the church. Second, we disciples are to pray that God would give us our daily bread. In other words, disciples along the road like us here are to unabashedly pray for our most basic needs. Needs ranging from the food we require for the day to the wisdom that we need to untangle all sorts of complex relational knots that we find ourselves in to help on a math test. And that God insists on knowing what is deepest in our hearts is remarkable for what it reveals about his heart. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I sense in myself a reluctance to share my most personal concerns with God. An instinct to limit my prayer to the big things, the hillside things, the kingdom things. And just as we learned, we are to pray that God's name would be hallowed, that God's kingdom would come, which we learned happens as we all and our Christian brothers and sisters all over the world actually live our salt and light lives. But Equally, we're to pray for matters, even though infinitesimal to everybody else, are immense to us. God says, share them with me. Now, the writer Richard Foster, a great Christian writer, says that if we're hesitant to do this, or it seems out of order in some way, it might be because we've actually lost sight of Jesus, whom he says, occupied himself with the trivialities of humankind. Listen to Foster here. Jesus provided wine for those who were celebrating, food for those who were hungry, rest for those who were weary. He went out of his way to find the little people, the poor, the sick. And get this, he welcomes us with our 1,001 trifles, for they are important to him. And praying for our daily bread means sharing with God what most 
intimately and practically concerns us. Third, we disciples are to pray for the forgiveness of our sins. As we journey to Jerusalem, as we live the purpose of our Christian lives, God's empowering spirit in us notwithstanding, we stumble in a million ways, don't we? We make mistakes. We do selfish things. We do silly things. We do self-destructive things like trying to escape reality, right? Shopping or substances. You know, too often forcing our family members to make Carly Pierce's recent hit, Your Drinking, My Problem, their soundtrack, right? To our great relief, our king recognizes, like the old hymn goes, we are prone to wander, even post-belief in baptism. But you know what he's done? He's given us a means of cleansing, and here's what it is. We simply confess. We confess to him how we failed, and then you know what he does? He bathes us in release and renewal. And what's more, we seek this forgiveness as we extend lavish forgiveness and lavish release to the people who have failed us. And finally, we disciples pray that we would not be led into temptation. What this means is pretty surprising. The Greek word here means testing. And we know from several passages in Scripture that God uses tests to reveal the deep tunnels, the the below-the-sand chambers of our hearts to spur further transformation. Nevertheless, very curiously, And wonderfully, we're directed here to pray that in God's wisdom, he would spare us of these tests. And pretty surprising, but there it is. One Christian has thought deeply about this fourth petition, and he suggested that when we pray that we would not be led into testing, we're implicitly praying that there would be nothing buried in the sands of our hearts that needs to be un earth. And I believe that one way to be the answer to this prayer is to persist in loyal, loving listening, especially in our hillside small groups, so that we can keep growing in Christ the easy way rather than the hard way. Does that make sense? Okay, that's the flyby of the Lord's Prayer. We've surveyed the substance. Now let's consider the style, which we find in verses 5 through 13. And with this, friends, we find our door to a whole new prayer world. Stay with me for this. Let's read. And Jesus said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he'll answer from within, do not bother me. The door is shut and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he'll not get up and give him anything because he's his friend, yet because of his impudence, he'll rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil... Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Now, if this passage does not crack us up, we've not had enough Turkish coffee this morning. We need a second cup. What does Jesus do here? He paints two pictures, both utterly preposterous. And first he says to his disciples, and he says to each one of us today by the Holy Spirit, he says, you know, imagine one night very late, you've just turned in, and this long lost friend raps on the door and he's ready to spend the night. And because it's late and because your teenagers have eaten all the bread that you baked that day, you're cleaned out. So what do you do? You do immediately what anybody would do in that situation. You go to your next door neighbor and you ask for three loaves. Now, 
Imagine your neighbor response. Gosh, I am so sorry. I just can't. You see, the door is locked and my kids are sleeping. I think you're going to have to go somewhere else. Bye-bye. Okay. Now, if we're the disciples hearing this, we're busting up. But to understand why we got to fill in the picture a little bit, first of all, first century homes were tiny. They were one room most of the time, certainly one floor. And this means that if the neighbor is giving this spiel to the breadless host, his kids are already awake. They are not going to be any more disturbed by their dad getting the bread. And second of all, and even more important, to provide food for a guest was a sacred obligation. In fact, the whole village's honor hinged on hospitality. So even if the kids are asleep, wake them up if necessary. Because feeding a guest, which was, again, a whole village responsibility, was about a zillion times more important. And to get just kind of a feel for the total lameness of this excuse, imagine this, men. Imagine... You head over to a friend's house in the middle of the night, and you say this, buddy, my wife's about to give birth, and the car won't start, and I got to get her to John Muir. Can I borrow your car? And imagine your friend responds this way, gosh, I'd love to help. I really would, but I left the keys in the kid's room and they're playing Minecraft, and I really don't want to disturb them. (laughs) And then Jesus hammers home his point. He says, guys, even though your neighbor is a selfish toad, (laughs) because he doesn't want the whole village to know he's a selfish toad, that's the reference to impudence in verse 8, he's going to give you your bread, isn't he? And you know it. And then before the disciples can stop laughing, he paints another preposterous picture. He says, imagine Jesus says, your five-year-old comes to you and says, Daddy, I'm hungry. Can I have some fish sticks? And imagine you reply, oh, you're hungry? How about a snake, right? (laughs) That would be outrageous. It would be appalling. It would be nearly unbelievable unless you are Dr. Evil, right? (laughs) And actually not even then, because as Jesus says, even evil dads generally give good to their children. And then Jesus then completes his point. He says, guys, if you being as flawed as you are, irritable, obstinate, clueless, boneheaded, always leaving the ice cream scoop in the sink for somebody else to clean, if you, being all those things, you still know how to give good to your children, and you do, how much more will your heavenly Father, who is none of those things, give good to you when you ask? And his point, obviously, is as large as a pyramid. Pray big. Pray with exuberance. Pray often. Because though our Heavenly Father, though awesome in burning glory, is generous. And I want you to hear this. You know, if we, like an ancient Egyptian artisan, if we engrave this picture of God into our minds, making if what making it what we see, when we pray that God's name would be hallowed when we bring to him the most personal and basic needs in our own hearts, when we pray for our own cleansing and forgiveness, and when we pray to be spared of tests, you know what will happen? We will pass into a whole new world of prayer. Verses 5 through 13, and that picture of God are that door. And to put it more plainly, when we take into our hearts the astonishing truth that because of the eternally generous heart of the one true God, Everyone who asks receives. His burning holiness, his fearsome splendor notwithstanding, we will pray with new daring. We will pray with new exuberance. We will pray with new expectation. Rather than dreading prayer, we will desire it. Rather than running from prayer, we'll revere in it. We'll look for times to stand before God, our awesome God, and ask 
And rather than snakes or scorpions, we will expect good to come back because that's how the one true God, the only God who exists, the Father, Son, and Spirit God rolls. And sometimes that good will be so obvious, other times less so. But when we pray, when we ask, we can count on some kind of good being cast back at us, even if it's the mere good of being spared something that we desperately want, but which God knows will wreck us. What's more, Jesus says in the very last verse, the least good that we can expect, the least good that we can expect, which in reality is the best good that he can give is refillings of his own self, his own spirit, his own personal empowering presence, the down payment of an eternal inheritance that is more wondrous than we could ever imagine. That's the least good. Sometime this week, someone in your orbit, could be somebody in your household, could be one of your children, could be a grandchild, could be your grandparent. Somebody in your orbit is going to face a big challenge. Someone's going to get a bad grade. Someone's going to run into serious relationship trouble. Someone is going to melt with fear about something, and maybe that someone will be us. And let me tell you, at first, we are not going to want to pray. We're not going to want to. We won't be in the mood, but then here's what I encourage us all to do. We're going to replay verses 5 through 13 in our minds. And we're going to remember the picture of the true God that Jesus used two brilliant comic sketches to paint for us. That because of the one true God's limitless generosity for his children, everyone who asks receives. And then having re-walked through that door, you know what we're going to do? We're going to pray exuberantly. We're going to pray expectantly. We're going to pray daringly for our daily bread, whatever that bread might be. And then we're going to set a watch And we're going to see what kind of good boomerangs right back at us. Why can God be like this? Why can God be like this? What allows him to be so generous? He's a God of burning holiness. Why can he be so generous with us, hearing our prayers, meaningfully engaging with us and responding to our prayers? He can do this because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And for us who've accepted that forgiveness and aligned ourselves with the Son, there is no longer any enmity between us and God. None. Rather, there's peace, there's friendship, there's partnership in God's purposes. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for how you made Luke 11, 1 through 13, a door for me this week into a new world of prayer. And I thank you for the fun of prayer over these last few days, for the joy of flinging dreams and desires and personal needs to you, and then waiting to see what good flies back from your generous hand. And I pray for my friends here, my fellow amazing racers, my fellow disciples, that as they press on in their journeys to Jerusalem, that you would remind them of this funny story that your son painted of grumpy neighbors and snake-serving fathers to set in bold relief your astonishing generosity And Lord, I pray that electrified by that vision, we would all engage you this week daringly, exuberantly, expectantly. I pray, we pray, in Christ's name, amen. Amen.